Yes, there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and start recording this. So for those who can't join us at this very moment, um, but I'm going to introduce Jules o Olson here. She is a, a librarian, fellow librarian and lifelong learner who shares her suburban home with her husband, son and beloved rescue pets. Who doesn't love rescue pets? Um, a dedicated <laughs> maker and supporter of eating and shopping locally. Um, Jules loves finding strategies and resources that support zero waste and spreading for the word with others, which is why I'm so excited to welcome her here virtually to uh, Thomaston Public Library. And thank you all for joining. Um, and we've got another late for the, the little straggler. Um, so we'll let them in. And Jules, if you want to take it away thank you so much sure great let me go ahead and share my screen my presentation oops what did i do there we go okay so uh thank you so much for having me i'm really happy to be here um as i'm going along if you have any questions go ahead and put them um in the chat and i'll make sure to leave plenty of time at the end um to you know you know go over any questions you have or any suggestions you have i often find um at these events that folks who are attending them already are doing lots of really great zero waste stuff and i end up learning from the audience members too so i'm looking forward to that portion of the evening for sure so um, I have a lot of content to get through, so I'm just gonna go ahead and dive right in. So uh, my name is Jules and uh, I and my friend, Suzanne Balbo, several years ago, um, were talking about our zero waste efforts and how much we love all the um, great content online for zero waste living, but not all of it really pertained to our lives here in Maine. Like being in Maine is very different than being in New York City or being in like, Southern California. So we were like, we're educators, you know, I'm a librarian, she's a teacher, we should put together a website and start um, offering classes and that sort of thing. And so that's how Zero Waste Me got started. So my Zero Waste journey um, started in earnest, probably about five years ago. It was something that I'd been interested in before or six years ago, maybe almost seven years now. But um, it, it really it really got serious when we moved into our new house and we had been here for a little while and with our house came this giant trash can and every week we would fill it up with trash like absolutely fill it up like there were many weeks where we couldn't even like fit it all in the trash can and we put it down at the end of the driveway and it would get taken away and we would do this week after week after week and then I don't know exactly <laughs> what the moment was where I said, this needs to change, but there, there was definitely a moment. And so I started um, making a really conscientious effort to reduce our trash and I started documenting what that trash looked like. So every week I would take a picture of, you know, the trash that we made that week and I would track it week by week. So I could really get a sense of what the difference was, which was really helpful to me when I was getting started. So now I would say that we probably make two small bags of trash every month, but honestly, I think it's probably less than that, but I like to round up <laughs> for the sake of honesty. So um, yeah, so we have really come a long way. And I want to say too that, um, you know, I'm really into the zero waste thing, but my partner is not. And my son isn't really either. So this is like a level that I think is workable for my relationships and my household. And I think that this is a sustainable level for us. So your sustainable level might look different and that's totally okay. Um, but this is where we are for sure. So when I first started zero wasting, like in earnest, everything was hard. Like everything about our society is designed for you to make trash. And so you're having to think your way out of all of these habits and systems um, and just, you know, just, there's every, everything is packaged, right? And so you're having to come up with a solution for every single thing in your life. And I remember how exhausting that was. So there might be a period at which you also are feeling exhausted, but I can say that for me now where we are, 
it feels very second nature. Like I don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about what I'm doing anymore. Um, but that's because I had to put in that mental effort at the beginning. So um, one of the questions that often comes up is, is zero waste expensive? Like is it more expensive than sort of conventional living? And I firmly believe that it is the opposite, that you can save a lot of money by doing zero waste. And so some of the ways that I have saved money is I do less recreational shopping, for example. Like that was something that I just used to do, like I'd be bored and so I'd go shopping. And I think about that now and that seems like a completely different life, but that's where it was. Um, I really think about like when I buy something, um, is it going to be durable? Am I going to be able to repair it? Does it have multiple functions? Can I use it for lots of different things? And at the end of its life, what is that going to look like? Am I going to be able to compost it? Will I be able to give it away? Uh, will it just have to go in the trash? Like what's going to happen with that? Um, I buy a lot secondhand, but I also do a lot of borrowing and lending. And I feel like this sort of idea of like a gift and a sharing economy is a really important concept um, with zero waste that not every household needs to have its own power drill. You know, like maybe you have the power drill and your neighbor has a mower and like you guys share something like that. Um, I bring my own lunch. I eat a lot more simply. I eat a lot of plant-based foods now and not a lot of animal-based foods. I hang out with my at home with my family and friends, which is of course what we've all been doing in the pandemic. <laughs> and I do a lot on my own. Like I'm a big maker anyways, and this has really ratcheted that up to another level. So that's my journey. Like that's the journey that I've been on and your journey may look very different, but I do think that there's some basic guidelines that are helpful to anyone who's sort of embarking on this. So number one, the most important one is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Don't give up. So like, don't have this like standard going into it that from now on, all of your trash is going to fit into a tiny jar for the rest of your life. And that's all the trash that you're ever going to make. And like, if that's the bar that you're holding up for yourself, it's going to be really hard to achieve that. And I've talked to a lot of folks who said, well, they used to do zero waste, but they really fell off the wagon. So they don't do it anymore. Like, you know, it's, it's something that you have to like keep doing. So don't try to do it perfectly. Just try to do it as well as you can and it will improve as you go along. Um, number two, so try, try not to be too judgy on yourself and with others. So, you know, I always think honey is more effective than vinegar. So, um, you know, like if you see someone who's like, I don't know, eating takeout, like with a styrofoam container and they've got like a lot of plastic utensils and it all came in a plastic bag, instead of being like, wow, you're making so much trash, like you could take out your lunch, like next to them, which has like reusable cutlery and that kind of thing. And you're going to make them curious about what you're doing. And I think that that's a much more um, effective strategy. Have an open mind and keep exploring. So, um, you know, there might be some ideas I talk about tonight that seem like outlandish, maybe something that you would never want to do, but like maybe a year from now that suddenly becomes something that you're thinking about. And you can keep finding new solutions to problems as they crop up. So like, for example, recently I needed to replace my pillow. And so with a little bit of research online, I found out that I could make a pillow out of buckwheat hulls. And so I made myself this buckwheat hull pillow. And at the end of that pillow's life, I can just compost the buckwheat hulls and purchase some fresh buckwheat hulls. And that will just be like my pillow from now on. Um, number four, you don't have to buy your way into zero waste. So if you follow a lot of social media accounts or um, you know, zero wasters online, it can all look very curated and very beautiful because they've got like, fancy stuff. And it doesn't have to be that way. You don't need to use a stainless steel tiffin. You can use like an old peanut butter jar and that's going to be a great for food storage container too. And number five, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So try to think about like the fact that this is something that you're going to try to be do trying to do for the rest of your life. It's not something that you just want to like, it doesn't have like an end, an end goal, right? There isn't like, okay, I'm going to do this for a year and I will have done zero waste. Like, you know, it's something that like you keep doing. So like 
you know, you can ease your way into it. Like you don't have to just like at the end of this presentation, like that, that's it. You're zero waste from now on. Like, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of make your way into it. It doesn't have to be all at once. So another couple of useful ideas is to use what you have, you know, um, this idea of like that you don't have to buy your way into zero waste. You probably already have all the zero waste solutions that you need in your stuff right now. Like when I'm talking about the, the things that I'll be talking about, um, the tips and strategies and the rest of this presentation, I don't want you to think about it like that you need to go buy something. Like you probably already have that thing. So um, like maybe you have a, a plastic dish scrubby brush. Like I have like seven plastic dish scrubby brushes. And like, as much as I love like the wooden ones with like the compostable bristles, like they're so beautiful, but like, I don't need that. I've got all these like horrible plastic ones that are gonna last forever, right? So I don't need to go buy the zero wasty looking thing. Um, and so the six R's of zero waste, like we all, we've always heard about like the three R's, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. Like to do zero waste, you kind of take that a little bit further. So refuse, like you can say no to begin with, like take yourself off like mailing lists. Um, if someone offers you something like a free sample that comes in a plastic cup, you can just say no thanks. Or like there's lots of different ways that just sort of like saying no at the beginning is going to you know, reduce trash in the long run. And so I recently heard a statistic um, that 90% of the waste that's produced is not actually like at the consumer household trash level. It's at like the production level of all of that. And so the best way to reduce all of that production stuff is not to contribute to the need for all that stuff to begin with. So that's all part of that, like refusing saying no. Um, and the other sort of new ones to repair, like repair everything, like practically everything can be repaired. And there's um, legislation that's like constantly being worked on that's sort of right to repair stuff. And if that's something that's of interest to you, you can Google that. There's lots of really great work in that movement. Um, and finally, Recycling and rot. I just want to touch on recycling really quick because I feel like sometimes people think like, oh, like I'm zero waste because I, re I, I recycle everything. But, but zero waste isn't so much about recycling stuff. Like that's almost like a last resort. You want to eliminate all those things before there needs to be a need for recycling because recycling programs, first of all, are not very equitable depending on where you are. There's very different access to recycling, but there's also just not much of a market anymore for raw materials, like stuff that we have thrown away, that we have recycled, put in the recycling bin. There's not a lot of market for that stuff. So really try to think of that as like the, the last resort. So I put that below rot, which is composting and I'm a huge fan of composting and I'll talk about that some more later in this presentation. So here we go. So we're gonna talk about concrete tips at this point. So I just wanna remind you once again that this is a marathon, not a sprint. You don't have to adopt all of these tomorrow. There's lots of other strategies too that I don't even have time to talk about tonight, but there's lots of different things. So adopt what works for you and you can ease yourself into the other stuff. So people ask, how do I start? Like, what do I, what do I do? So what's in your trash is gonna be really different than what's in my trash. That's just the way people work, right? So start by doing what I've seen called online a trash audit, which is I think a great phrase. Like really look at your trash, like figure out what's in there. Like take a look like, and figure out what is it that you're throwing away? Is it food packaging? Is it cleaning materials? Like, what is it? And then go after those things. So I, I advise getting started with the low hanging fruit, like pick some easy things and eliminate those because it's going to make a big impact on the volume of your trash. And that's really going to like inspire you and give you that like kickstart that you want to like do even more. So whatever that is, go after that. So when you're going out into the world, there's a lot of trash that just sort of ends up accumulating um, just from being a human in the world, right? And so 
create a zero waste kit and keep it with you. So that keep it with you thing is like, don't put everything you could ever possibly need into this zero waste kit, because if it's enormous, you're not gonna actually bring it with you. You're gonna end up leaving it in your car, you're gonna leave it at home. And so it's not gonna do you any good when you actually need that thing. So kind of be strategic about this and figure out what are the things that you end up needing when you're out in the world. Like, I think a couple of really basic things are a drinking vessel of some kind, because that can be like your water bottle, it can be your coffee cup, it can also be like a really great compost container. There, excellent demonstration over the course of the day. So like if you have like an orange for a snack, you can put the peels in there and then take it home and compost your peels when you get it home. Um, it also works as like emergency food storage. So if you have that like, you know, beverage container with you and you go out to lunch and you don't have a food storage container, you can like put your leftovers inside of your beverage like container, depending on what it is. Like that's a really multi-purpose item. It's very handy. Um, some sort of napkin or towel because that's gonna prevent needing napkins and towels. But like you can use that for all kinds of things too. Like that can be like an emergency food storage container as well, or like all sorts of things. And reusable bags. I always have a couple of reusable bags that I keep in my bag all the time. I use them for everything. So that's what my zero waste kit is. Like that's what I always have with me. You might need other stuff. Like you might eat out a lot. So like take a food storage container, like take some silverware with you, like whatever it is that you end up needing, those are the things that should be in your zero waste kit. Um, reusable bags. I don't wanna like harp on like specific examples too much, but I do feel like this is a great one. And it's also really exciting that Maine just uh, put into effect the single use plastic bag ban. But like, if you just think about <laughs> like, how individual choices add up. I feel like the plastic bags are such like a great concrete example. Like you using individual, like the uh, reusable bags, if everyone did that, like the aggregate of that would be so powerful. And I feel like that is such a great nutshell example of why zero waste efforts matter. Cause it can be really easy to feel discouraged and to think, what is even the point of me trying to do this when the rest of the world is just making so much trash, you know? And I feel like, you know, I just think about things like this. Like if we were all doing like one of these things, like how much of a difference would that make? So I'm not gonna get too much into like specific examples, but I didn't wanna harp on that one a little bit. So household paper goods. I feel like this is a really easy one for people to make swaps with. So Kleenex, you can use hankies. Um, you can use cloth napkins. You can use um, like washcloths, rags. Like textiles are always a great replacement for paper goods. And I also want to put under this bracket too, um, like single use food storage things. So like cling wrap or aluminum foil or wax paper or whatever. There's lots of um, like textile based things that are handy for that too. So there's like beeswax wraps. Um, there's also like silicone bags, there's jars. Like I just use jars for everything, honestly. So uh, that's that. And so hankies, hankies has been one of the things that we have put into effect in my household, like right from the beginning. And it was amazing. Like. We, we have them, here's, here's one right here at my desk, like it's blurring out, but I have a jar of hankies right here and we have them all over the house. And it's been something that has been a big zero waste success in our house that my husband has been very much on board with. And there's a lot of really great zero waste books out there, but this one here, Zero Waste Home, this is my favorite one. So if you're looking for just one zero waste book, this is the one I'd recommend. I love this book. And like, as I go along in my zero waste journey, when I look back at that, like when I, when I go through it again, I'm like, oh, like I'm doing so much of this now. And I remember thinking at the, at the beginning, like when I first read it, I'm like, oh, this is nice, but it's very aspirational and impractical. And like, no one can actually do this, but like, I'm doing so much of it now, which I feel like just shows you how you sort of get acclimated to these new approaches to things and it becomes easier. So with food, I feel like food packaging is the biggest challenge. Like 
everything comes in packages. So whenever you can, just right, right out of the gate, choose the unpackaged version of things. So like I have seen at the same grocery store, there will be like loose carrots and packaged carrots, like buy the loose carrots, or there will be unpackaged lettuce and packaged lettuce, like purchase the unpackaged lettuce. So that's a really easy swap to make. Um, and sometimes like you might have to sort of if you if there's like multiple grocery stores near you or there's multiple farmers markets or whatever you'll kind of start to identify which ones have the most unpackaged options and you can spend your money there because what's more powerful than the consumer dollar in determining what retailers do um so bulk bins depending on where you are in the state you may or may not have access to bulk bins um but the way they work in a nutshell for people who aren't familiar with them, you bring in your own containers. So you can bring in jars or fabric bags, like whatever works for you, reusing like old paper bags, anything. And if it's something that has a weight to it, like a, a jar, you weigh it first to see how much it weighs. Then you, put, then you write that down or you take a picture of it with your phone or whatever, how you, you wanna record that. And then you fill it up with the product that you want to buy and then they weigh it again and then they tear out the weight of the, the vessel. So some people use jars for this. I actually have um, very much gotten on board the fabric bag train because it's lighter. Like I don't have to worry as much about what they weigh. It's just much easier to use with the funnels and that sort of thing. So um, that's, that's my experience. But if you don't have um bulk shopping options near you and I like I said I know that a lot of places don't you know look for the packaging options that you're going to be able to compost or reuse um you know recycle if you can't do the other things um or the largest possible package so like for example if the if you if you're looking for rice and there's no bulk option for rice and so you have like a one pound plastic bag of rice or a five pound plastic bag of rice buy the five pound plastic bag of rice because the packaging in that is less than the than having like five one pound bags of rice. Um, and whenever possible, try to avoid black plastic packaging. That's the, the stuff that just never ever gets recycled. So toiletries um, are fun because they're satisfying and you'll use them every day. So every time you use them, you're gonna be like, oh, I'm so good at zero waste. But like also they're just like, aesthetically satisfying, you know? And so, um, you know, different things work for different people. I know I keep saying that, but I feel like that's an important caveat to make, but um, there, the a rule of thumb is if you can buy it in a solid form instead of a liquid, go for the solid form because it's probably not going to have packaging. And if it does, it might just be in paper packaging as opposed to like an entire plastic bottle. Um, there are some services uh, where you can, like, you pay a deposit on like a stainless steel bottle or an aluminum bottle or whatever, and uh, you they fill it up with shampoo and you use the shampoo and then you send the bottle back and they'll refill it. Um, so that's an option. And there's also lots of stores, um, you know, around where you can refill um, liquid soaps and other things at the stores. You can use whatever packaging you want. But I really try to go for the solids whenever possible because it's like less fuel to ship it and it's like a concentrated version of whatever the thing is um, and lots of other great stuff. So shampoos and conditioners, you can get those in bar forms instead of liquids and like any other product for your hair. I feel like sometimes you have to try a couple before you find one that you like, but don't give up. If you try one and you don't like it, find another one and try that. Um, lots of other things here. There's like moisturizer, soap. Again, try to go for like the solids whenever possible. You can make your own toothpaste. There are bamboo toothbrushes um, where you just pull the bristles out when you're done and you can compost uh, the bamboo handle. And so all that you're left with to go in the actual trash is just the, the bristles. Um, there's lots of makeup that comes in either recyclable glass or stainless steel containers that you can also just reuse or you can get refilled. Um, lots of different options there. Um, 
deodorant, again, you can get it in refillable containers. You can make your own. Or I noticed at Target recently that they started carrying lots and lots of paper packaged deodorant, which I just thought was so exciting because I'm like, okay, so there's this, you know, a greater interest now in packaging that can be composted at the end of its life cycle instead of having to go into the trash or recycling. Um, shaving supplies, they have uh, um, reusable safety razors that are just like a couple of pieces that you put in a, um, a shaving blade. And so you upfront buy like maybe a 20 or $30 razor. And then instead of having to throw away the razor or throw away like all those complicated, very expensive heads that they sell now for different razors, you just buy your 20, $30, stainless steel razor thingy and then a box of razor blades that's probably going to last you the rest of your life and and like that's a much much lower waste um approach to shaving menstrual supplies there's period underwear there's recycle or uh, reusable cloth pads there's um menstrual cups lots of situations lots of solutions there and for toilet paper you can try a bidet and I feel like the bidet, people always are like, oh, okay, she's lost her mind. But thanks to the pandemic, we've all maybe thought about bidets a little more. So that's awesome. A silver lining there. Um, and I do want to say too, like use up what you have first. So again, like at that idea, you don't have to buy your way into zero waste. Like if you, after this, look at all the plastic packaging in your bathroom and you're like, oh, this is so terrible. Like don't start buying zero waste solutions yet. Like wait, use up what you have. And then as you need to, you can start phasing in those uh, zero waste things instead. Um, so repair and maintain. I feel like this is a sort of piece that of our culture that we've just sort of left behind. And like, these are all skills that our grandparents had, you know, these are all like services that like our grandparents lived with that often don't exist anymore. So, you know, find that shop that's going to repair your bicycle and your shoes find that tailor who's going to repair your clothes like take good care of your vehicles like sometimes just like good maintenance of things you know like reattaching your button before it falls off and then that shirt becomes like much more difficult to deal with afterward like you know take care of stuff so it'll last longer and re repair it as needed instead of just automatically replacing it with a new a new item so gift wrapping, um, around the holidays, we always just made such an astonishing, horrible amount of trash between like the packaging that everything came in and all of like the wrapping paper and like the tape and like the bows and the ribbons and like all of it. It was just so much trash. And I feel like our uh, gift giving occasions now are when I really am like, wow, we, we've come so far because we won't have any trash after our gift giving occasions because we, you know, wrap with like things that I store up all year. Um, so like I hang on to all the brown craft paper that comes through the house or like bits of ribbons or like twine. And then like, I'll, you know, dry some like orange slices or apple slices and use some like cinnamon sticks or like little pieces, like cut off pine trees or whatever. And it always looks beautiful. Like people are always like, oh, this is so pretty. And like, all of it is just stuff that I kind of collected. All of it can go in the compost um, at the end of it. We also do a lot of cloth wrapping. So over here on the left, this is called furoshiki and it might look complicated, but it's actually really simple to do. And if you've ever worked at a Subway <laughs> sandwich type place, you already know how to do this, trust me. So um, yeah, if you could just Google furoshiki wrapping, you'll see lots of great ways to do that. Um, cleaning. So cleaning supplies. Like I have recently realized that not everyone knows how to clean with these things. Like they think it doesn't work. And I think that that's because they're probably just not using it correctly. So if you ever have any questions about how to clean with just soap, sun, vinegar, or baking soda, you can reach out to me. My contact is right on our website and I'm happy to help you, but I swear to God, all you need are these four things to clean practically everything in your house. Um, so laundry, there's a lot of things going on with laundry. So if you're, if you're washing synthetic fabrics, they're going to shed what's called microplastics, like teeny, teeny, tiny pieces of synthetic fibers. 
So to start out with, um, you know, when you're when you're choosing clothes to purchase or make or whatever, try to choose um, natural fibers because those will break down naturally. So plant-based fibers, animal-based fibers. So thinking like cotton, linen, hemp, silk, wool, these kind of things will biodegrade naturally in the environment. environment. Unlike things like um, polyester, uh, spandex, uh, vinyl, anything like that, that's not going to break down naturally. And so when things get washed in the washing machine, they release all these microplastics that are so small that they can't be filtered out by the municipal water, uh, water cleaning. And so it just like aggregates in the water. So that's something to really think about. And if you have synthetic clothes already, you can, there's different products that you can use to capture those microplastics so they're not being released into the water stream generally. Um, there's one called uh, Guppy's Friend, um, but there's other things that are like that too. And so what you do is you put your clothes into this bag and you wash them and then the bag traps all those microplastics with it, which like eventually they'll build up and you can remove them. So they're not being released into the water as much. It's not a perfect solution, but it's better than, you know, throwing your clothes away. And then you have the whole item being go going into the trash. Um, so static solutions, you can try um, compostable dryer sheets. Uh, you can use dryer balls. You can, um, you know, hang your clothes to dry. Uh, indoors or outdoors, especially with brown tail moth in Maine, it can be really difficult to dry clothes outside, but um, I find Maine is generally pretty dry, and so you can hang a um, drying rack indoors and dry your things on that too, so that works out pretty well. And just ask yourself, how often do I really need to wash this? Sometimes I think that we like overwash our stuff more than we strictly need. Things can be used more often than we do. So composting, I love composting. So depending on what your situation is, there are different composting solutions that work for different people in different environments. I have just like decided I'm gonna do all the comp composting. So I have a worm composting bin, which I call like my like magic compost that I use in my garden because it's just so good. And like, they don't like eat all my compost. Like I have more and there's stuff that they can't eat. like onions and bread or things like that. So I also have like a tumbler, which is like my super fast composter, it composts things really quickly. And I also use um, both my worms and my super fast composter for lots of paper stuff that just inevitably accumulates in my house. Like I put it through my shredder and then I put all that stuff in the compost. And I also have a compost bin that's similar to this one in this picture, but is not as attractive. Mine is just like a you know, slap together a set of pallets. And that's where I put all of my like uh, chicken coop shavings and like yard waste, um, any overflow stuff that's like too much for my other two composters. So I'm a big composter. And I feel like anything that enters my life at this point, I want it to be able to co be composted when I'm done with it. Like, so if I, if I buy a shirt, I want to be able to wear it for a really long time. I want to be able to repair it. I want to be able to maintain it. And then it'll become rags or become like fabric that I use for something else. And then once that fabric has just like completely disintegrated to absolutely nothing, I want to be able to compost it. So that's sort of like how I think about the life cycle of items. And there's a lot that you can put in the compost. So, you know, the things that you sweep up around your house, you can shred the paper like I talked about. Um, cardboard can go in there any um, uh, thread or fabric that is uh, a natural uh, plant or animal based, not synthetic, um, all kinds of stuff. So composting. Um, so like I said, find what works for you. Like maybe not everything I talked about here will work for you, but there's lots of other stuff too that you can be doing. Like I don't have time, like I could not possibly tell you <laughs> in 40 minutes, like all the, all the different stuff that I do, all the different stuff that I've learned, but like, you know, just keep, just keep exploring. And if something doesn't work for you, that doesn't mean you have to like give up, you know, keep that open mind and keep exploring. 
And not everything has worked for me. Like I've tried making my own toothpaste and I have very sensitive teeth and like, I thought I was going to die. Like I cannot use homemade toothpaste. Like I have just had to say to myself, you know what? Like, this is just going to be one of those things that I just use the packaging. And that's, that's just the way it is. And that's compromise because we're in it for the marathon, not the sprint. And maybe someday I'll be able to make my own toothpaste without wanting to die. So. Um, so stay motivated and do more. So, um, you know, why are you here tonight? Like, I feel like having, you know, sort of that clear objective of like, why did I get into this? Like, what were my reasons? And being able to remember that and think about what keeps you inspired. Like what keeps you going? Like for me, like having these kind of events inspires me. Like I leave them and I'm all like fired up about zero waste again. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. We're going to like take on like, you know, corporations and we're going to like, you know, make changes. It's going to be awesome. So whatever for you, like fires you up and keeps you inspired, like figure that out because you're going to need it. Cause sometimes it's hard and find a community and get involved. So if you're, maybe it's your partner, maybe it's some friends, maybe it's a Facebook group, whatever it is, I think it's really helpful to have someone that you can bounce ideas and strategies off with. Very helpful because chances are any problem that you're having, someone else has already had it. And so instead of having to go through all of that like emotional and mental like labor figuring out what the solution for that is you could just ask someone else and they'd be like oh this is what I do you can be like wow that's a great solution thank you for telling me that and I also want to say that being less than perfect with zero waste does not mean you're a fraud like and I'm saying this because I feel like this is something that everyone thinks at some point in their zero waste journey and like I struggle with that a lot like I'm like, oh, how can I possibly like be teaching classes when I just ate corn chips from a gas station that came in an unrecyclable package that like I knew was wrong, but those corn chips were awesome. Like, should I like cancel an event? Like, no, it doesn't make you a fraud. It's okay. Like we're human and we're existing in a world that is not designed for you to reduce your trash. It's okay. So don't stop at zero waste either. Like, like I said, you know, household waste is only 10% of a hundred percent problem. So hold producers accountable, elect people who care and will take action. So uh, uh, Mills just signed um, extended producer responsibility law into effect, which is a huge step forward. And if you're not familiar with that, try Googling it. Um, you'll get lots of information. The Natural Resources Council of Maine, Natural Resources Council of Maine has a really great website about that. Um, those kind of laws are going to be what's truly going to change things moving forward. Um, I know that using and con consuming fewer animal products can be like a real like emotional a uh, roller coaster for people. So I'm just going to say it and I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to move on, you know, travel less. And I say travel less as someone who has a long commute to a job I love. So this is again, one of those, like, doesn't mean you're a fraud, but you know, try to travel less and support local everything, like get involved in your community because it's all connected. If you're volunteering at your co-op, if you're volunteering at a local farm, if you're volunteering at a literacy group, all of those things all come back to zero waste, I believe. Um, so this is my website. There's lots of great information on there. Um, there's also a interactive map. So if you're trying to figure out retailers near you and what they offer to help you with zero waste, that map is a really great resource. And so questions, clarifications, suggestions, feedback, this is the time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jules. Feel free to unmute yourselves, folks, um, to ask questions or share things. So I'm just looking at the chat right now. Oh, thank you for spelling the furoshiki wrapping. And yes, making a variety of bags in different sizes. Like the sewing machine is a zero waster's best friend, like a hundred percent. And also like if you're not a DIYer, just reusing gift bags, like those gift bags will last years. And so will the tissue paper that's in them, honestly, you can keep reusing that stuff. So you don't have to be like a, a skilled person 
to reduce your trash. Hi there. Oh, I see some hands going up. So Alice. I just want to make sure that people know there are some companies that I consider very responsible. I sometimes order things from Bob's Red Mill Company because I can't get them locally. And they send their packaging and it's in, it looks like peanuts, like the plastic mm -hmm. peanuts, but they're all compostable. They're made of cornstarch. And I literally tried it. I put them out on my mm -hmm. garden and I watered them and they break down. And there's oh. no reason why every single packaging company couldn't use those. So Absolutely. I think that's a great, and I, I want people to shop there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, oh, did the person next to you also, yes? William. Uh, Noel. William. One oh, suggestion. If you're flying and you're wearing synthetic clothes and you happen to have a fire on board, that synthetic yes, clothes can stay on your skin and give you a serious burn. Or if you have to slide down one of the escape hatches, that again, synthetic clothes will give you a serious burn. So the idea is to wear wool or cotton clothing and then you won't have that issue. Yeah. That's true just generally that synthetics are more flammable. Absolutely. And I think Noel just has had a hand up too. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we like to do here is for oh, almost almost everything we buy, we try to buy secondhand. Mm, yes. I don't know if you mentioned that, but um, I mean, the clothing industry in this country is a horrendous, wastefully, horrendously wasteful company. Um, process. And uh, so, you know, we'll buy at yard sales at, at um, Salvation Army, Goodwill, whatever, and uh, try to buy quality clothing that'll last us a long time. And yeah. um, you know, we're also big fans of Bob's Red Mill and <laughs> in bulk, like at Rising Tide Food Co-op in Damariscotta and other places. And, um, and a lot of times we just try to do without, like say we, we really want some cookies, we'll just make the cookies. Right. You know, instead of packing, buying the package of Oreos or whatever, um, and it, we've, 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 it's improved our diets also. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Can you think of anything else or some other things that we do a whole lot of things, but we've got some good ideas. I would love to know um, how, Jules, how you do your, you say you decorate with orange slices. I love that idea. Do you use a dehydrator? Because you didn't yes. have pictures. I kind of wished you had pictures of some of your things because I wanted to see the bag that you carry your your zero waste um, kit in, in your car. I'm assuming it's a bag or a box or something and I didn't see a container for, for all that kit. Yeah, I actually keep it right in like my purse. So whatever purse I'm using and like purse, it's really more just like a messenger bag kind of thing. And so I just keep everything sort of squirreled in there. So I have like my coffee cup in like an outside pocket and I have my reusable bags like tucked inside, like one of like the zippered pouches things. Like I keep like, you know, I keep hankies in there. I keep like a whole like pouch of things that I might end up using. And it's just in like a regular, a regular bag. Yeah. If that's oh, one, other thing that we, one other thing that we've started doing recently is I bought some bamboo paper towels mm. and they can be washed like over and over. Mm. And, uh, mm -hmm. there are, and there, sometimes you do say, gee, you know, I, I really don't want to wash that, whatever <laughs> the animal left on the floor, but I can just throw that out without feeling bad about, you know, throwing out a, a really nice rag that I want to reuse and, you know, laundry and reuse again. But, and that doesn't mean we don't buy any paper towels because honestly, not everybody in the household is excited about these washable paper towels as I am, but I don't get fanatical about it. I just try to use them when I can. <laughs> yeah. When I, I will say when I do in-person events, I bring a lot of props, but I had found right away that the size of the screen made it really difficult to be able to show all of the, the, the things that I have. Um, but yeah, I just, I just use a food dehydrator. So I just like, uh, I use like the orange peels. And so like, I'll make like little spirals or whatever, or like little, like, so I cut them into stars or whatever like while they're still fresh 
And then I dehydrate them and they're like shrinky dinks, you know, if you remember those <laughs> from the eighties and they kind of like get small and hard and cute. And then I use those to decorate. Wow. The oranges will shrink up. Will, will you can slice orange slices into shapes. I use the, just the peels. Like I eat the, okay. I eat the inside. I do yeah. use whole slices of apples. So like if the apple has kind of like gotten like a little shriveled and mealy and maybe not like great for eating, but maybe okay to sacrifice for like gift wrapping, but I slice them. Um, like if this is the apple with like the stem coming off the top, I slice them this way because then you see, see like the little star shapes inside where the seeds are. Um, yeah. and then I just dehydrate those whole and those are, those are always a big hit. Sounds sound really nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, and yeah, secondhand, absolutely. Like practically everything you could ever need, you can buy secondhand and then you're both diverting that item from going to the landfill. And you're also reducing what would inevitably be like packaging on the new item and like the fuel used to transport those items and like the everything else. And yes, the textile industry is shocking. Mm. Absolutely. We, we have a question in the chat from Gail. She is wondering, um, are the inks in most paper non-toxic, i.e. is all paper safe to compost? I'm picky with like the paper that goes to my worms. Like I give them um, like newsprint, um, like, unbleached paper for the most part. Like sometimes I'll, there'll be a little bit of shredded like bleached paper for the, but for the most part I give my worms like kind of the least processed papers. Um, for newspapers, mostly what they use now are soy-based inks. Um, so that's okay. I wouldn't give them like the mailer inserts and those kind of things, but so yeah. So the worms get like the, that's what the worms get into the like speedy composter. I'll put most things, but like the really glossy, like cardstock type stuff, I don't even try to compost that. I feel like there's so many like finishers on there that A, I don't want it in my compost, which I'm gonna apply to my garden. And B, I have doubts about how well that would compost anyways. And of course I take out like any plastic windows or like some, like, I don't know why they do this, but they're always like sticking stuff in junk mail to make it look more appealing or whatever. So I take that crap out and I peel off the glue and stuff, but then I just like put it all through the shredder and put it in my, um, in my speedy compost. I used to try to put it in my big compost pile and <laughs> the crows would just like scatter the bits of paper all over my yard. So that doesn't work. But um. Yeah, so there are some things, there are some papers that I wouldn't put in my compost. Um, I am a little selective about that, but I would say the vast majority of things, of paper that ends up in the house, I do end up composting that. I'm wondering if Jules or maybe anybody who's attending has any good solutions for medications, like those stupid blister packs that they come in. I hate mm -hmm. those, but well, not I feel everything like, comes in a bottle. Yes. I feel like medications, you get a free pass. Like <laughs> there are like some things that you should not have to feel guilty about and like genuinely taking care of your health. Like you should just let, let, <laughs> let all that baggage go. Like just take the medication that you need and don't worry about that. Like, I feel like there are just some things that you have to say, like, you know, I'm going to take care of myself first. But that having been said, we can agitate the producers to change the packaging that that's coming in. So instead of blister packs, they can put it in like reusable or recyclable bottles or that sort of thing. So I feel like that's a issue at the producer level and 100% not a consumer guilt. Yeah. Take your medicine. Don't feel guilty about it. <laughs> Any other thoughts or suggestions for folks? Oh, and I, I also wanted to elaborate on um, Noel just uh, uh, point about like cooking from scratch. So definitely cooking from scratch um, is a great way to reduce food packaging trash. 
um, like it's not always like a perfect solution. Like if you're making chocolate chocolate chip cookies, like there might be some ingredients there that come in like plastic bags or whatever, but you'll be able to make so many batches of super delicious homemade chocolate chip cookies. And it'll be much, much less packaging than like the commensurate number of store-bought packages. Yeah, absolutely. Cooking from scratch, um, shopping locally for food, um, you know, opting for that more plant-based diet, all of those things are going to be really important strategies for reducing food packaging, which is the most difficult I have found. Like there's just still food packaging waste in our house, which is a challenge. Yeah, for, for people who are local, um, uh, Rising Tide Co-op in, in Damerscotto was mentioned, but also Good Turn um, just in Rockland has uh, bulk bins and a lot of great options. Are they on the map? Do you know? They are. Often? They are. Okay. Good, good. Yeah. And I know that I, Rising Tide was, but. I think there's a butcher in Rockport who's also on the map. Um, Main Meat, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, there's, there are some good local options on the map on uh, Jules website. What about fresh off the farm? Oh yes, fresh off the farm. That's another one. Thank you, Alice. Yes. So um, yeah, it, right here in uh, Rockland, Camden, Rockport, there's some really good, really good options. Any other questions? I think somebody else had unmuted, but I didn't hear a question. I guess, Sue, did you have a question? Nope. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing somebody. <laughs> yes, I can see it. I can see your hand raised. Go ahead. Um, is it me? Okay. Yes, it is you. <laughs> one, other, one, other, one other idea to reduce packaging is grow a garden. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you and know, everybody, it, but you know, and I also, I start seeds and I, I'll share seedlings with neighbors too. So. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I, um, I have a, I have a, I have a small garden and I, you know, of course, like it's all organic and I have had a herbicide expo exposure and we can't, I can't pinpoint who the herbicide exposure is from. So the, the state is actually coming out to take some samples tomorrow so we can try to figure out where that herbicide exposure is coming from. And I will just say it has been an amazing experience because I emailed them Sunday and I got an email back this morning. And then by this afternoon, I had two appointments lined up for them to come take samples to start the investigation and then um, do an interview on Friday with them about it. So if you ever have a, pe a pesticide or herbicide exposure, at least there's people looking out for you on your side. What were the signs, Jules? How did you know? Well, I got this damage on my tomatoes that I had never seen before, where at first they kind of like, like fell over a little bit. And these are really tall, 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 tall. They're like, they're like six feet tall, like cherry tomato plants that were gorgeous, like gorgeous. And then they kind of fell over a little bit at the top and then they straightened back out. And then all of the leaves, not, it's not like tomato leaf curl where they mm -hmm. curled in like this. They have like <laughs> retracted in this way that kind of makes me think of like in the Wizard of Oz, like when the like feet go back under the house, like that's, they, they have just like completely retracted into themselves and they're hard, like, mm -hmm. like toenails, like, like dog toenails now. And they've shriveled up to absolutely nothing. And so the entire top third of the plant is like, you can see the stems and you can see these little tiny hard green nubs where the leaves used to be. And I was like, what the heck is this? And so I started Googling and like it, it is very distinctive of an herbicide exposure. Hmm. Yeah, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. Wow. It is strange, yeah. Because yep. I'm I'm terrible at keeping plants alive, to be completely <laughs> honest. So I would have just assumed I did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would normally think that too, but like this was it was so weird, and it happened like almost overnight. Oh, it wow. was like it was really fast, and then and then it like engulfed the entire top third of the plant. And so like I have a lot of questions like 
that I'm waiting to ask the state, mm. like, is it safe to eat anything that survives on these plants? Like, what about like anything in the area? Like, is the rest of my garden like affected? Should I eat anything from my garden? Like, how can I compost the plants that were affected? Can I compost anything from my garden? Like, how long will it live in my soil? Like, mm -hmm. and there's lots of small gardeners like myself who have little, you know, victory type gardens like in my neighborhood. And I haven't seen anyone else with this particular type of tomato damage, but like, if it's coming to my yard, it's going to come to other yards too. So yeah, that's my, that's my sad herbicide story. Um, and this may be too much information for folks, but I was thinking about your point earlier about the bidet, if you've been hmm. thinking about it. Um, I switched a few years ago and I never want to go back. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yes. And, yes. and that whole toilet Amen. paper shortage did mm -hmm. not affect me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. They're amazing. Yeah. And they're, they're super easy to install. You mm -hmm. do not need plumbing experience to tackle mm -hmm. one of those. It's it there. Yeah. It's just an attachment that goes on your toilet. It hooks into the toilet line. So clean water's coming in. It was super easy. Yep. Yeah. Yay. This is me giving you a little virtual high five. <laughs> <laughs> um so we're coming up on six o'clock any any final questions or, or anything anybody wants to share there's been a lot of great sharing um of ideas and um and suggestions so anybody? well I'm going to take that as a no, but <laughs> thank you so much for, for doing this presentation, Jules. This was really, really great. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.